New series, never taught it before, it's brand new. We're going to be on it the whole summer. Every week we're going to cover a new Old Testament hero. The goal is, is that by looking at what made them heroes, we can learn from them and it will help us to become heroes. Amen? And yes, we do. I love Tina Turner, but I don't like that song. We do need another hero. We need all the heroes we can get. And, we, and really and truly, there are heroes walking among us. There are many heroes in this room tonight that no one knows their name. There was a young man in our office today, and he was in there for a meeting with Shannon. He was walking out, and Jared and I were sitting there going over these things and some other things as Shannon was doing some things. And, and uh, he, ca he came in and sat down, and he sat there, and he told us about his life. And when he got up and walked out, I turned to Jared, and Cruz was in there. No, uh, uh, Jimmy was in there. And I said, there goes a hero. Now, many of you don't even know his name, but he truly is a hero. He is a hero to me. He's, he's, he and his wife are fighting a great fight for, their, for her health. She's going on, on all kinds of treatments. And, and they got little kids, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and he's working full-time, and he's doing all this stuff, and he's just speaking the word as he sat there, and he's just speaking so strong and so powerful. And I just thought, man, there's a hero right there. There's a young guy that is fighting and being a hero. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen? And so... You know, heroes aren't just in, 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 in the history books, although there's a lot of them, thank God. All right? And so I'm so, be, I'm so grateful that the Scripture is so clear and so powerful in describing to us these people. What you're going to discover, if you don't already know it, as we go through these teachings on Wednesday nights, there's actually going to be 11 of them we're going to look at. Uh, next summer, we're going to do all the New Testament heroes. So this summer, we're going to do the, some of the, a lot of the Old Testament. How many of you know there's more than 11? <laughs> but we're, you know, there's just, we just went through and picked some of them. Some of them obvious, some of them not so obvious. All right? But they're still incredible. And what, what you discover when you look at them and as you study them, and I'll just make this as an opening remark as we get into it, is that, is that they, were, they were people just like you and me. And what you discover when you look at their lives is that they weren't perfect by any means. Uh, the man we're going to look at tonight, Abraham, was by no means perfect. And yet, he was called the friend of God. And that's why he's first. When you're called the friend of God, you ought to be first. How many of you agree with that? <laughs> Amen. None of the other guys were called that. Just Abraham, the friend of God. All right, but they, they, they had great moments, and they had moments that I'm sure they're not so proud of. All right, and I love that the scripture includes that, because that, 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 that really speaks to you and me, doesn't it? Amen? None of us are perfect. Any perfect people here tonight? None of us are perfect. All right, we're all works in progress, right? God begins a good work, and he will complete it. All right, he will complete it. So, so we are all in that completion, completing process. Amen? Amen? The important thing is, is that we're growing, we're changing, we're being penetrated by the Word. Right? The Word is pointing to us and affecting us. So it's a good deal. All right? So let's begin talking about Abraham. Let me give you a little bit of history about him. You can read about this in Scripture, and then I also dug up some other history things that maybe will help you to understand him a little bit. It helped me a lot. All right, Abraham grew up and lived in, in, a, in an area of, of the world at his time that was called Ur, U-R. Uh, history tells us that Ur was located on the Persian Gulf where the Euphrates River empties into the sea. It would be that part of the world that we would call Iraq. All right, so he lived in that part. He lived in a very... Uh, the, the city that he lived in, it was incredible because the, 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 the Euphrates River emptied into the sea there that was very fertile, uh, that was a very prosperous area. The city was very successful, all right? It was a large and a prosperous city because it was on the ocean. It had all this beautiful water from the Euphrates, fresh water, and so the land was very fertile and it was a, a, a good place to live. Uh, being a shepherd, it provided him and those like him with acres and acres of grasslands and pasture lands where they could uh, graze their sheep. So it was very conducive, all right? Uh, because he was a shepherd, he did not live 
more than likely, most historians believe he lived outside of the city. All right, he was not in the city proper itself, so he lived outside of the city. It was, the area was inhabited by a group of people called the Chaldeans, all right, which if you know much of your history, they were a very powerful uh, tribe of people in the ancient world, all right, they were the Chaldeans, and uh, they were the descendants, the Chaldeans, for those of you that like this kind of stuff, they were the descendants of Noah's son, Ham, all right, so after the flood, Noah's three sons spread out, right, and these were the descendants, the Chaldeans were the descendants of Noah's son, Ham, all right, the Chaldeans were known for being uh, grossly idolatrous, I mean, they were into all kinds of idols, all right, and uh, so that was the atmosphere that surrounded Abraham as a child and as a young man. Uh, they were really involved in nature worship, all right? By nature worship, they worshiped trees, flowers, animals, the moon, the sun, the stars, the sky, a river, whatever, okay? So they were all into nature worship, and history tells us that they were, this nature worship was expressed in their lives and in their city in gross indulgence and impurity, all right? It was a very we would call carnal, immoral society that Abraham lived on the outskirts of, all right? So he saw that, it was there, it was a part of it, all right? And out of that atmosphere, right, and this, this, this grossly uh, immoral society, God chose to accomplish, you might want to write this down, God chose to accomplish his purpose for all of mankind by separating unto himself one man. One man. And through the separating of that one man out of that entire society, he pulls Abraham out by separating him, all the world will be blessed. One man. Now that obviously, and you know, I'm sure many of you are ahead of me there, but to me that has always encouraged me so much. You know, God doesn't need, honestly, God doesn't need five superstar Christians in your family to change your family. He just needs one person. Just one. He doesn't need Billy Graham to go to work in your office. He just needs you. Just you. One church can change a city. One church. One man and if one woman. Just one. God can take one of us and change so much. All right? Now, Abraham... It is, as we look at Abraham's life and as, and as we get into looking at him, when God speaks to him, all right, and tells him in Genesis chapter 12, which we'll look at in just a second, Abraham responds immediately to God's instruction to leave his house and to go where he tells him to go. What it says to us here is that Abraham must have been raised in a house that rejected the philosophy and the believing system of the region in which they lived. All right? He, he did not hesitate. He, wasn't, he didn't wonder about it. That somehow, even though they lived in this grossly indulgent, grossly immoral area, Abraham, through his father, must have held on to some of the beliefs of Noah that had come down. All right? And so they, he instantly, so it, it shows us once again how important what goes on in our houses is to the future of our children and how they respond to when God begins to speak to them. Could I get a good amen, right? How, how we raise our children in our houses. You know, we live in a very, uh, in some ways, an incredibly immoral society today. And in some ways, not entirely, but in some ways getting more immoral all the time. We are to being told all the time 
that, that, you know, what the scripture says is wrong isn't wrong. And, and so we need to make sure that we are raising our children properly and correctly. Can I get a good amen tonight? So that when they hear the voice of God, they will know the voice of God and they can respond to the voice of God instead of being uh, confused because of other believing systems that have been allowed to creep into them. Is that good? All right. Now, go with me to Genesis chapter 12, and uh, let's, let's, begin, let's begin to look at a progression of events that, that created what Abraham becomes known for. All right? There's two things that Abraham is called. He is called the friend of God, and he is also called the father of faith. The father of of faith. Wow. Man. If you're going to be known for two things, that would be two great things to be known for, huh? Hey, remember Abraham? Yeah, the friend of God. Yeah, the father of faith. Yeah, not, oh, yeah. You mean the bum? No, we mean the friend of God, the father of faith. Yeah, that's a good thing to be known for. Genesis 12, verse 1. All right? And the Lord said unto Abram, okay, this is where God changed his name. Get up, get you up out of the country from your kindred, from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So he speaks to him that day. Keep your finger there and go with me to Acts the seventh chapter. The apostle, uh, Luke, the uh, uh, apostle Luke writing in Acts gives us a little more understanding of what went on here. All right? He gives us a little more explanation, right? And he said unto the high priest, are these things so? Verse 1, and he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Sharon. And he said unto him, get you out of your country, from your kindred, come into the land which I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Sharon. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So he gives us a little more information here of the land that he took them to, right? He brought him out of Iraq and brought him to the new land that we would now call modern-day Israel. All right, so it was quite a journey. All right, so he brought him out of Iraq and brought him all the way to what we would call the modern-day Israel. So he brings him to that place. So it wasn't just a, a little trip, all right? When he left, at this time in Abraham's life, he is 75 years old. He is 75. I'm too old. He was 75 years old. But we need to read that in relativity. He dies at 175. All right, so he's really just a kid. Okay? So, all right, and he settles in an area that was then called Shechem or Shechem. All right? Uh, what was interesting is, is that back in that day, I want you to see this, Right, because it, it all has a point. I know it sounds like a history lesson, but there, it's, it's going to connect for you. When he comes into this area, there is no city. It's sparsely populated. It's dry. It's barren. It does not look near as good as the land he left. All right, the land he left was spectacular. It was green, had abundance of water, a major city on the seacoast, lots of pasture land. And God brings him to a place that doesn't look near as good. All right? But he comes to that place. All right? And he comes there. Look at verse 7 of this chapter. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto, unto your seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now, what's interesting is, is that God makes him this promise. He said, I'm going to give your seed this land. He didn't say he'd give it to Abraham. He said he would give it to his seed. You know, there are things in life that we do 
and our obedience is, affects our children and our grandchildren. And I believe that's a part of being a hero, that you are willing to do the thing God tells you to do, even though maybe it doesn't benefit you, but it's going to benefit your seed that comes after you, that you are willing to do that. Amen? I believe that heroes care about the people around them many times even more than they care about themselves. That they, they choose to be obedient or they choose to make a hard choice that maybe isn't going to get so much for them, but it's going to make a huge difference in those around them or in the lives of their own personal seed. Can I get a good amen on that tonight? And so God says, Abraham, he said, look, you're not going to inherit this land, but your seed is. Your seed's going to get it. Now, I told you a moment ago the land was sparsely populated, but that doesn't mean there wasn't anybody there. There was some really powerful tribes there. And, and, and over time, Abraham's seed is going to conquer them. And today, they dwell in that very land. They are there today. It's their land. It was given to them divinely. It belongs to them. All right? And so they're there. All right? So they settled there. Now, there's three things I want to point out to you before we get into, into the other stuff, all right, that I was looking at today that I'm just going to summarize, just kind of go with me on this because if I, if I take you through it, we're not going to get to the main part of what I feel God wants you to look at tonight, all right? But there's three things that characterize Abraham's life while he is dwelling in the land, this land, right? First thing that you notice as you study it is that no time in that hundred years does he ever build a permanent residence. The whole time he's there, he lives in a tent. For a hundred years, he lives in a tent. I'll show you why in just a moment. Well, let's go look at it now, okay? So he dwells in a tent. All the time he's there, he never builds a house. He dwells in a tent. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? A hundred years? I mean, I mean, once, once a guy decides he's going to live there, right? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you build a house? I mean, I find that very interesting, but there's a principle to it that we need to see, and it's a principle that speaks to us and the way we live our life and the way we approach our life. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm setting up a new tent uh, selling business outside, so I was, no, no. <laughs> kidding. I'm not saying that, but there's a principle here that I believe God worked through Abraham for us to have in our lives. Keep your finger here in Genesis and go with me to Hebrews 11. Let's begin in verse 8. By faith Abraham, are you there, Hebrews 11? Yes. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Underline that, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing whether he went. So when he left, he just knew he was supposed to leave. God didn't tell him where he was going to end up. How about that? Pick up your wife, pick up your sheep, pick up your stuff, and leave. I'm just going to point you in a direction. And you're going to walk till I tell you to stop. <laughs> How about that? Wow. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So he said he dwelt in a tent. Never built a house, never built a permanent residence. He stayed in a tent. Why? For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. All right? So he, they, they introduced this thought, right? This thought that, that we as children of God, get this now, that we as children of God, this is not our permanent city. This is not our permanent home. In fact, we are simply sojourning through this world. This is not what we were made for. This is not our permanent place. We are looking for a city made by God. That is where we are going. We are like Abraham in that we are 
temporary residents of this world. We are here in this land of promise, but this is not that what I was born for. This is not what you were born for. You were born for a city whose maker was is God. That that is the foundation we're moving towards. That city. Can I get a good amen tonight? That is the city. So what God is saying to us is through Abraham's life that that we are here but we live for a bigger purpose. We live for a greater calling. We are moving, we are headed towards a greater place. And that this has no permanent hold on us. This life that we are in, we see it for what it is. We are simply passing through it, right? We are on our way to a better city. Can I get a good hallelujah on that tonight? We are moving to another place. Amen? Amen? So what that does to us is, the same thing it does to Abraham, it keeps us above the cares of this world. It keeps us focused on this city that was made by God, that we are, we are, we are headed towards that place, that I'm not going to get so entangled in this world that it, that it keeps me from moving towards the next one. Amen? Amen? All right. So, so he, lived, he dwelt in a tent. The second thing is, you read it right there, everywhere, and Abraham would move his tent constantly, and everywhere he moved his tent, he built an altar. Now, the history book I was reading today, the author of the history book said that those, some of those altars that Abraham built are still standing today. Suddenly, I had this urge to go see them. I, said, I, I thought, oh my God. Now, if somebody could guarantee me they could take me to the Middle East and show me an altar that Abraham built, I'm leaving tomorrow. No, I can't. i got to teach this weekend. But I would figure out. I would go see that. that. That motivates me. That motivates me. It's like, you know, I've never had a big urge necessarily to go preach or minister in India. I'd like to go see it historically until Peter Youngman, Younger told me that you can actually visit Thomas's tomb. It's there. He's actually buried in that tomb. And I was like, let's go. <laughs> and then somebody told me the other day that in Syria, you can actually visit, it's documented deck thing, you can visit John the Baptist's tomb. It's there, it's buried right there. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to Syria. <laughs> Little crazy over there. All right, the inmates are, okay, here we go. All right, so... Uh, everywhere he went, he built an altar. Everywhere he went, he built an altar. And when he left, he left the altars. So everywhere Abraham went, right, everywhere he went, he made everyone know that he worshiped the God, the true God. Everywhere he went, he left a trace that he had been there, the trace of his faith, the reality of what he believed. He left the altar everywhere he went. There was no secret service, hidden spy Christian called Abraham. Everywhere he went, he built an altar to his God. He was always under accountability to God. He lived his life that way. Amen? Amen. In a land surrounded by all kinds of worship of other gods. Everywhere he went, he built an altar. Look at Genesis 18. Are you learning anything tonight? Amen. Genesis 18. Look at verse 19. Look what God says about Abraham. Verse 19. I love this. I love this. Rochelle and I found this verse before we ever had kids, and we said this is how we're going to be. Genesis 18, 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. God said, I know Abraham, that he will teach his children. He will teach his children. He will teach his children. Hmm? I believe that's one reason why God chose Abraham. Because he saw in Abraham that he would teach his children. Amen. 
You know, I can't dunk a basketball, but I can teach my children about serving God, loving God, being accountable to God, and passing that faith to their children and their children passing that faith to their children. Amen? Amen? See, I believe that makes you a real hero. A real hero. Give your kid a Corvette. Who cares? Give him faith in God. It'll take him all his life. All his life. Are we learning anything tonight? So he built an altar. All right? The other thing you notice with Abraham as he dwelt there and he dwelt in the land, right? Was, was he lived in a tent, he always built an altar, and he always talked about the promise, right? He talked about the promise, talked about the promise, and the promise was, unto your seed I will give this land. The promise that God gave him, the promise that God gave him, and Abraham held on to that promise, took years for that promise. Remember when God made the promise to him, he had no seed. It's 25 years later that he had Isaac, 25 years, 25 years. Pastor, I've been, I've been believing God for a week, 25 years. <laughs> 25 years. And he didn't have a great church to go to like this. He was out there by himself, 25 years. Wow. All right. Now, one more thing I want to show you, and then I'm going to take you into what I really want you to see here in the last 10 minutes. All right? Good, good teaching night. We're all right? Yeah. All right? What makes a hero a hero? It's pretty clear, isn't it? All right. The other great thing about this, this time in there that, that I wanted to point out to you, and you can go home and look at it. In Genesis 14, Abraham, for the first time in the Bible, the word tithe is used. Abraham fathered tithing. All right? He was the first time it was used. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. And what's beautiful about it, Melchizedek was his high priest, and Jesus is, is after the order of Melchizedek. All right? Uh, Hebrews 7 teaches us. And so, and it says that Abraham gave tithes of all to Melchizedek. It didn't say he paid them. It said he gave them. All right, he gave them to Melchizedek, right? What had happened was is that Abraham had had a great victory in his life. He had defeated a king of that time who in that time historically, we would have called, he would have been the Attila or the Napoleon of his time. And Abraham with 300 servants defeated that king's army in one night. Took down an entire army in one night with his 300 servants and brought back all of the, the loot and all of the captives of Sodom and Gomorrah, including his nephew Lot, and got them all, and he came back and he gave a tithe of everything to Melchizedek. He started that relationship between the seed of Abraham and the priesthood, and he started that relationship. And today I submit to you that the new seed of Abraham, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, that we are also to follow in the footsteps of our father Abraham. Could I hear a good amen tonight? And tithe to our priest who is after the order of Melchizedek, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So tithing began in Abraham's life. Now, go with me to Romans, the fourth chapter. All right? I spent a little too much time on the other stuff, but we'll get it done. All right? So Abraham was known as the friend of God. He was known for that he would, that he would teach his children. He was known because everywhere he went, he, he built an altar. Right? He always left a, a, a remembrance of his faith in God. He was always clear about who he, whose side he was on, right? And, and, he, and he maintained it, and he, and he fought through it, all right? But he was also known as the father of faith, the father of faith. So I want you to see here in Romans, the fourth chapter, how that faith was manifested and how that faith worked. Are you ready? i got eight minutes. Think I can do it? Oh, ye of little faith. Here we go, all right? Romans 4, verse 17. And as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, Speaking about Abraham, before him whom he believed, even God, right? So Abraham believed God. Who did Abraham believe? He believed God, all right? So that we all say, okay, obviously. Even God who quickens the dead, watch, and calls those things which be not as though they were. 
All right, so Abraham learned from God the principle of faith, and one of the principles of faith is, is that you call those things that be not as though they were, right? God speaks of the end from the beginning. He, he calls those things that be not. What be's not? What be's not is the end. So he speaks of the end from the beginning. Abraham embraced that. When God said, change your name from Abram to Abraham, Abram means the father of many, which is kind of comical because he didn't have any, all right? And then he changed his name to Abraham, which means the father of many nations. And Abraham said, cool. Start calling me Abraham. Really, how many kids you got? None? Call me Abraham. Why? What was he doing? He was calling those things that be not as though they were. All right? So I'm being a little analytical here, but I want you to get it. Okay? So that is a, pro a process of faith, of living by faith, that Abraham gave to us, right, as the father of faith. Let's continue on. Who against hope believed in hope. So there it literally says, when all, when all human reasoning for hope was gone, he still believed in hope. So there is, there is available to us in this realm of faith in God and believing God that even when human reasoning tells us there's no more hope, God said there is still reason for hope because with God all things are possible. All right? So Abraham gave us this, and how much has been done in the earth when men and women just still had faith, still had hope, when all reason for hope was gone. They still had hope. Amen. That he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thou seed be. Do you know that Abraham did all of this and believed all this on one promise? One promise. One promise. He didn't have this. He didn't have all these promises. He had one promise. God said, so shall thy seed be, as the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. One promise. He didn't have this. He had one promise. He didn't have a great church to go to. He was building the churches everywhere he put his tent up. He was the pastor and the congregation. <laughs> one promise. It's amazing what a man can do when he makes up his mind he's going to believe the promise. <laughs> Amen? Well, pastor, you know, I just don't know that much Bible. Do you know any? Well, I know, I, I, I guess you tell us every week, God's on our side. Is that Bible? That's Bible. Then you know a promise. There you go. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. Amen? See, this just really encourages me. Can you tell? It just really encourages me. I love Abraham. He's a hero to me. Because he just took one promise. And being not weak in faith. Being not weak in faith. The word weak means faint-hearted, double-minded. Spoken of those whose minds are easily disturbed. You got to toughen up, buttercup. <laughs> Amen? It's your mind. You know, you, you, can think, you, you, can, you can think your mind anywhere you want it to think. You, you can move it from here to there. It's your mind. I can't control my mind. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You can control your mind. It's your mind. It's not on remote control. The devil doesn't have a remote control to your mind. You can move your mind anywhere you want. You can think about this. You can think about that. Right now, you're listening to me, right? And if you wanted to, you could start daydreaming and go off somewhere else and come back an hour later. You can think about anything you want to think about. It's your mind. And so, you, so Abraham made up his mind that he wasn't going to be double-minded. Well, I know God said it, but I don't know. You know, she's 191, and I'm 100. She's never had a kid. Her womb's dead, and, you know, we don't know. Nothing's going to work. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't look at me like that. It's in the Bible. You're going to read it in just a moment. And being not weak in faith. So thank God Abraham taught us that, right? Not, not, not to be easily disturbed in your mind. Not to be easily disturbed in your mind. Make the devil work for it. 
being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. Here you go. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. See, I was scriptural. <laughs> now watch this. Look at this. He, being not weak in faith, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Write this down. The word staggered there means he did not argue within himself. 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 Man, that is life-changing right there. Don't let the devil create you, get you to arguing with yourself. Well, I know the Bible says that, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. What, what if, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Tell yourself to shut up. <laughs> I've had to do that. I've had to look at myself in the mirror and say, you shut up. <laughs> Amen. We learned that from Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. The word unbelief there means simply means lack of trust. Lack of trust. Can we trust God? Lack of trust. He staggered not, didn't argue with himself at the promise, at the promise through lack of trust, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. God, watch what he says now, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that, watch, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Can you believe that? I bet you can. I bet you can believe that. Believe what, Pastor? I bet you can believe that what God promised, he is capable of doing. I can believe that. He's God. He said he could forgive my sins. Well, I believe he can do it. I believe he has the capability. He said, he's, I, he, said, he said he was able to supply all my need. Well, I believe he's able to do that. He, he's God. God. Now, if I come up to you and tell you I can supply all your needs, you've got reasons to doubt. But God? He's God. I believe he's able to perform what he promised. Thank you, Abraham. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. That's what I want you to see, right? Faith gave him right standing with God. This was life-changing for us as people, that faith gave us right standing with God. Not works, not good deeds, not sacrifices, not what you punish yourself for, no. Faith, faith alone can give us right standing with God. Not works, faith. God is looking for faith. Not works, not punishing yourself. Faith. Faith gives us right standing with God. I love it. So simple. And what's beautiful about it is that everyone can get in on it because whosoever's can believe. Now, whosoever's may not be able to do some of the works stuff, but whosoever's can believe. You can believe. Oh, I can't. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can because believing is a choice. It's not a gift, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Pastor, I don't, I don't know if I can get up. Yeah, you can. You can get up. Just believe he's your stand-up and your recovery. Listen now, I'm almost done. Almost done. said, Abraham believed God. What you got to be careful of here is that you don't put faith in you, but you put faith in it's not faith in you, it's faith in God. Let me say that again. It's not faith in you, it's faith in God. Oh, Pastor, I can't do it. No, we know you can't. You're not God. It's not faith in you, it's faith in God. It's faith in Abraham believed God. Abraham didn't believe in Abraham. Abraham believed in God. Who are you believing in? Are you believing in you or are you believing in God? Believing in God, right? I'm believing in God. I believe in 
God, right? I believe in God. Faith in God. Now look at verse 23 and 24. This is why I read all this to you tonight, and I've kept you a little late. I hope it's all right. Now it was written, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. To whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again when we were justified. Right? So all of this that we read tonight, all of this story was in here, wasn't written to pump Abraham up. It was written to pump you up. It was all written for your sake, for my sake. God says, do it Abraham's way. Do what he did. Follow your hero, Abraham. The father of faith. I have to stop. Did you learn some good things tonight? Are we off to a good start? Amen. Stand to your feet with me, please. Let's pray.